Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, thank you for those of you that answered the poll and asked uh, whether we should do one more day of, of Lyapunov and sums of squares versus trajectory optimization. We're gonna do one more day and uh, we'll do trajectory optimization just uh, you know on Thursday. Everything should be shifted and fine in the calendar uh, and I'm excited, I, 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 I love this material. I hope I can ex ex uh, convince you maybe even at the first part here as we talk about the rigid body dynamics, why I think this is so fundamental and why it's so uh, such a nice way to think. And honestly, every time I teach it, <laughs> I, I feel like there's, um, there's still so much low-hanging fruit on things that people haven't done or, or we haven't, certainly haven't fully explored in this space, uh, ripe for research. <clears throat> okay, so, so let's dig back in. Um, you know, my, my number one goal for today is we've talked mostly about Lyapunov as just a, a way to analyze systems that you've already got, the closed loop system. So if someone already gave you a controller and you're just asking, does it work? You know, does it get to the origin? Does it avoid running into things? But I want to think about how do you use these Lyapunov conditions to change the way we do control? Instead of finding the optimal controller, you just want to find a sufficient controller um, and one of the big themes actually is that finding a controller plus a certificate for that controller at the same time is actually a very good idea. It's, um, it can make both of the problems relatively easier. If, if someone just hands me an arbitrary controller and says, prove that, that's actually a harder, it's a harder problem than if I say, I, if they say, here's a plant, come up with a controller that you can prove something about. Oftentimes, co-designing the controller and the Lyapunov function is better. Okay, but let's dig in. I, I want to finish the thing that I didn't get to last lecture, which was the rigid body dynamics version. And all of our Lyapunov conditions, you know, have been saying, well, so V of X greater than or equal to zero, or whichever form of this, right? Um, and then V dot of X less than or equal to zero, and since this is vx f of x, <clears throat> and since we've been working a lot with polynomials, we've so far said um, if we choose Lyapunov candidates that are polynomial and my dynamics is polynomial, then we have this powerful tool chain in sums of squares optimization. But our, um, you know, our equations of motion you know, are not polynomial in in the original coordinates. And this is the simplest case, the, the simple pendulum, but in the general case, as I write my equations for the acrobat or for a humanoid, I've got a lot of terms that are not um, immediately polynomial. They have these trigonometric terms that come inside, okay? I mentioned quickly in a, in a response to a question, but I, you know, the, they are actually polynomial, but they're just not polynomial in the original coordinates, right? So going from theta as a, like a, a rotary angle of the, of the joint, that's a natural way to express our equations of motion, but it's not the one that exposes their polynomial form. Um, you could think of it as, instead, if I look at the positions of different parts of my joints, for instance, the way that those operate are polynomial. The positions, like I said, are held together by rigid bodies, which are constraints that the positions are a constant distance, and distance in a Euclidean space is a polynomial thing, okay? But I can, so, so, so maybe that's the justification by why it should work. Well, how does it tech work in practice is I can just go through and I can take all of my sine thetas and just make a new decision variable s. I could take my cosine thetas, make a different decision variable c, okay? And if I have theta one or you know, theta i, I, I do this for every one of my i's. 
And since we're able to work with different types of constraints, the one extra thing I need to do to make sure these are related is I'll add an additional constraint saying sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. And in general, when I start going digging into using my sums of squares um, tool chain, I can just write one more condition saying that I only care about these things when sine squared, you know, I, I only need my Lyapunov conditions to be satisfied when sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Okay? So to see how that could play out, um, if I, in the pendulum, if you'll remember, I actually, even in that first opening example, I actually used this as my coordinate system, S, C, and theta dot. You can write your dynamics in that coordinate system, right? You just get C, theta dot, negative S, theta dot, and then our B, theta dot, plus MGL, S. Okay. <clears throat> And this is still polynomial in those, in these coordinates. So this is not, <clears throat> this is not something you can do always for any arbitrary function that has sines and cosines in it. The, the equations we get out of our mechanical systems have sines and cosines that enter in a particular way. I always, I get sine theta, I'll get sine of theta one plus theta two, which I can break up into polynomials of sine theta and cosine theta with my trigonometric identities. But I never get something like sine L theta or sine theta dot theta or something. I don't, I don't get my other terms inside here. I get simple, these trigonometrics are direct functions of one variable, which is theta, okay? So they have a special structure that allows me to do this substitution. And when I stay, even when I go through the dynamics, I'm gonna stay in this class of polynomials with respect to that basis. And the, you know, I can just show you lots of examples of it working and I can appeal to hopefully to the mechanics argument of why it, it must work. There's a, there's, okay, so there's different types of joints on a robot, right? You can have prismatic joints, you can have re revolute joints. If you look at a robot description file, there's a handful of different joints you can pick. They almost all work. There's one that doesn't work, that's not polynomial. Screw joints are not polynomial because they mix translation and rotation all in the, in the same coordinates. So don't use, don't build a robot with screw joints. That's, that breaks everything. Um, I mean, they, they can be useful, but, uh, but they screw up the math. Okay. So does this make sense? Is that, that um, you know, my claim is that when I write down general uh, equations for my robots, they can be polynomial, but in a different basis. So most of our tools are gonna to apply. To do, um, you know, to write my sums of squares program on something like this, if I wanted to find a Lyapunov candidate with sums of squares, which I've shown you we can, we can do, I said we're gonna find, you know, a V of X, which is M transpose X, P M transpose X, right? But my monomial basis now has, a, is a basis of, you know, one sine, cosine, just like we talked about before. But everything still works. And I can search for the coefficients of, um, of V by searching in P. And then I have one more constraint to add. I say that negative V dot of X plus lambda of X times sine squared plus cosine squared minus one is sums of squares, okay? Where lambda x is a, another polynomial with coefficients that have to be fit. But it doesn't have to be a sums of squares polynomial. So you remember that there were, were two cases of this Lagrange multiplier, this S procedure. If I wanted to say that g of x less than or equal to zero implies something, um, then I, for the less than or equal to, I would demand the Lagrange multiplier to be positive. 
but when I have g of x equals zero implies something, which is what I have here, sine squared plus cosine squared minus one equals zero, then I do not require this to be, poly to be uh, positive. The intuition is that when sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, this term contribute, cannot help this be more sums of squares, right? This thing must be, this thing must be positive when sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. But when sine squared plus cosine is not equal to one, I'm allowed to do anything I possibly can. You know, I, I could choose any multiplier on top of that to help this total sum become positive. Okay? So that's it. Now we have the ability, because we have our parameterization in P here, we can search over P and search over the Lagrange multipliers here. And this is the thing that found us the energy with a convex optimization. Okay, I added another, uh, there was a, a few small details. I said that I want V of zero to be zero just to set the scaling. But other than that, it found the, it found the, the pendulum's energy. Yes, please. Why can't you just set the quality constant for constant to the time? Why don't I write an equality constraint? Yeah, okay, I, I see. You're saying, why don't I just write sine squared plus cosine squared equals one down here as an additional constraint? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Okay, it's, it is a strange modeling language and you really do have to work with it to, to get your head around it, okay? So <clears throat> S, C, um, I mean, th this X here, remember, has got S and C and theta dot in it. Those are not decision variables, that, those are indeterminates. They're never actually handed to the solver, right? So, so when, I, when I write this optimization, if I were to just say find me, you know, searching over P and the parameters of lambda, I'll call, I don't know, I'll put an alpha here, and alpha, you know, the, uh, a solution subject to all of these constraints. The solver never sees, you know, these are the decision variables. X are indeterminates. Minutes. Okay, they are a construct in the head of the engine that writes this, sends us the, the program for you. If I were to say this, the solver wouldn't know what to do with it. It doesn't even know what that means. So I have to encode it somewhere in the, directly in my sums of squares layer. Great question, thank you. Okay, so um, rigid bodies are polynomial, but it's deeper than that. Um, it's bigger than that, okay? So are there any other questions on that? Let me do the, the thumbs up. Will people, is that, it doesn't have to be up, but somewhere in the middle, okay. Let me ask, ask any questions about that before I move on. Yes? You said they're indeterminate. So you'd have to add them to the solver somehow. How would you make them decision variables? Good. <clears throat> okay. So when I, when I construct my program, I have them up in the board. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I won't write the code right now, but there's two different things I can, I can say. Start a mathematical program. And I can say new decision variables, new continuous variables. That's how I get my the decision variables. And there's a different API, new indeterminates. And that gives me the, the X's, for instance. I'll say new indeterminates. <clears throat> I've, that's just my front end. When I write this sums of squares equation, it does all the tricks that we've talked about of writing that. <clears throat> All it's doing is it's saying, you know, if I, if I have one plus two x squared plus whatever equals m of x transpose plus p2 m of x, <clears throat> the constraints it adds are that some of the elements of p2 must equal two. They make the coefficients match. 
okay? Those are the constraints that when you call is a sums of squares, it, it, it will produce a bunch of linear constraints and one positive definite constraint for the solver. And that's what the solver sees. It sees this as a decision variable and it sees the coefficients of these potentially as decision variables. But this is a construct that is just an intermediate representation that helps me write those expressive functions. It doesn't ever get passed to the solver. It's not a decision variable. And it's our way of saying for all x. Right, a decision variable ha takes on a particular value at the optimal solution, whereas an indeterminate is, some, is a quantity you want to hold for all values, undetermined value, indeterminate value. It's just a game that we play in the, mid in the intermediate to give you this language of talking about positivity over for all x. Yes? Awesome. Okay. I'll say it again just for the camera, but so, so we're gonna, we want to talk through this, why does this sine squared plus cosine squared impose that constraint? <clears throat> okay, so why is this the right way to say sine squared plus cosine squared equals one? This, so it does not impose a constraint, and I think that's where the, the language is getting me. Um, what this is saying is that I'm making, so if I, if I asked for V of dot of X to be sums of squares, that would be asking it to be sums of squares for all val values of S and C, right? So, so I've got lots of values of S and C, and I'm asking for, as a function of S and C, V dot to be negative ev everywhere if I don't have this. That's a hard thing to ask. I mean, I don't know what functions would be re required. Um, I could tell that didn't land, but let me say the rest and see if it, if it lands, okay? This is just, this is not, you shouldn't think of this as imposing a constraint. You should think of this as making the problem easier by saying, when, I, when you're not S squared plus C squared equals one, I will help you by adding arbitrary positive or negative terms as whatever is necessary. I will make the problem easier by adding extra terms of, that you get to pick to make this thing be positive. I'm not allowed to help you when sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. But any other time, I'm allowed to add arbitrary extra terms to help your, help your mission of being positive, okay? So it's not a constraint. It makes the problem easier in some sense, but it, it's a language that says, when sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, that implies that V dot is negative. A little better, a little better. Awesome. Okay, there's one more. So, so I, the sine squared plus cosine squared is um, isn't the part that I find deep. It, I mean, it's it's neat, it's good, but there's a part that I find really deep, I guess, about this stuff. And that is um, the way we address the next step, which is that actually the dynamics aren't, the dynamics of most of our multi-body equations aren't actually polynomial even in S and C. They're rational polynomial, okay? So remember our equations of motion look like this. I can leave that off for now, <clears throat> but It is true that I have m of q, c, tau, g, you know, these are polynomial in q dot sines and cosines, unless you put a screw joint in your robot, okay? But the dynamics, if I want to write down the dynamics, you know, what is my x dot equals f of x. It looks like q dot, and then it's got an m inverse here. And that screws everything right up. That's a rational polynomial now, in general, OK? This is the inverse makes this a rational 
polynomial. polynomial. Right, in the scalar case, it's like a polynomial over a polynomial. It's an interesting class of functions, but it's not the polynomial class. Okay, so, so what do we do to address that? We don't actually write our, we can, we can write our Lyapunov conditions differently without ever actually requiring the solution f of x. I can write my equations of, uh, directly in this form. Okay, and the trick there, which I, I want to start at calling it a trick, but I want to tell you, I want you to realize how excited I am about it. <laughs> okay, so um, this is sort of, this is an explicit way to write the equations of motion. Where the derivative is an explicit function of the state. In many, for, in many applications of mechanics and other fields, there's often, it's often, certainly in geometry, there's often um, use of implicit forms, okay? So an implicit form for the dynamics would be if I wrote instead a function g of x and x dot equals zero. Certainly, I could write this, you know, I can, it's, this is only more general, because I could always write f of x minus x dot to describe g. Okay, but I could also write this without taking an inverse to, be, to write g. Does that make sense? This is, I, when I look at this right here, I say this is the implicit form of the dynamics. And this is the explicit form. If I have to, if I want to do simulation or something like this, I actually need to, to take the explicit form to make, to march myself forward, okay? There are implicit solvers too, but, um, but in, this is a more general description of the, of the system of equations. Here, I have G of Q, Q dot, uh, Q double dot even in this, in the second order case. Right, plus C minus tau G minus B U if I had it. I'm leaving it off for now. Okay, equals zero. That's an implicit form of the equations. Now it's interesting. So so I don't, you've maybe caught on, right? So the um, you know Drake has a dynamics engine inside it. It has a symbolic equations. Of, it's a symbolic engine inside it. Um, you can ask for these symbolic equations of motion for our robots. That, that was really hard <laughs> to do. Uh, most, a lot of people don't care, but I, I care deeply and I spent years trying to make that work. But you still, if you take, uh, the, you know, take equations of Atlas and you ask for the symbolic form, it will say, no, I can't do that. Because you can't take a symbolic form in any practical, I mean, it's just too hard to take a symbolic inverse of a big mass matrix. That just explodes the, you know, that, that inverse is a nasty, nasty symbolic object. We just never tried to support it. So you can't even ask for the, for the symbolic form that you need to write a sums of squares problem for, uh, for Atlas. But you can ask for this form. There's a, there's a, right next to, you know, calc time derivatives, there's a calc implicit time derivatives residual method. Okay, and I, we've gone to great length now, so it, even if you have a whole bunch of controllers plus your plants plus everything all wired up in a diagram and you ask for the implicit form of the equations, it can give you that. Or, you know, it can give you this form or this form. But if you ask for the symbolic version, it can, and it's got a, a, a multi-body system in it, it can only give you this form because it, this is the only tractable form. Okay, I don't know. It took me like a minute to say it, but it took years to make it work. Um, okay, and this allows us to now write um, sums of squares problems, for instance, on the, on the equations of motion directly. So how do we do, if I have the dynamics like this, how do I write the Lyapunov conditions? Okay.
we're going to lean on the same trick of the sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. The same way we can use equality constraints in our sums of squares, we can, we can use implicit form to describe the dynamics. So I'm going to say I want a function v of x greater than 0, sums of squares, for instance. And then I'm going to make my indeterminants our x so far. And I'm going to add a new one. I'm going to add another set, z. And I'm going to say what I want is partial v partial x times z negative is sums of squares. So I'm going to use z as this like artificial placeholder for x dot. But I'm never going to explicitly solve for x dot. I'm going to write it implicitly saying that g of x and z equals 0 implies that this In the same way I wrote that sine squared plus cosine squared, I can do the same thing and I can write with a Lagrange multiplier saying I'd like v, partial v partial x times z to be negative everywhere. That would be great. But I'm willing to help every time that z does not, you know, and g of x z does not equal zero, I'm going to add arbitrary positive terms to make that true. So it only, only has to be held when g of x equals zero. g of x z equals zero. Same trick, right? I write this as negative partial z plus lambda x g of x z is sauce. Same trick. When this is zero, this must be must hold. The conditions must hold. But when it's non-zero, I'm allowed to help. Now, why am I so excited about that? Okay. <clears throat> This, I think, finally reveals the fundamental structure of the equations of motion in our optimization, OK? So when you start talking about optimization of polynomials over a, quotient, over a ring, <laughs> over, over the, um, the set of equations generated by a set of polynomials equal to 0, then you can bring in stronger tools from algebraic geometry to bear. I can, I can write equivalent formulations of this on the quotient ring. I'm not going to give you an algebraic geometry lesson, but I just want you to see that there's structure that's finally available here. Like when, when I write dynamic programming on a mesh, I take all of my physics and I just throw it out and I sample it and I, I break all the beautiful symmetries and all the, all the structure that came from mechanics. When I write it down like this, I'm revealing the structure of the equations, all the symmetries, all the beauty is here. And I can now make this optimization better by leveraging powerful tools that exploit that structure. For instance, there's, uh, we wrote a recent paper that's uh, cited in the notes. Um, <clears throat> there's a way to satisfy this equation without ever writing that down. You actually just take samples which, are cert which certify this. And because g of x is a polynomial of some fixed degree, there's a finite number of samples I need to take to guarantee that I've, I've satisfied this condition perfectly without solving a big sums of squares problem. Just because polynomials can only do so many things in a certain degree, a certain um, set of variables. And you take this massive, scary sums of squares optimization and you write something beautiful down where the equations of motion define my optimization. I know, I know I didn't give you any, enough to, to really go on that, but it, that's the hint, right? If you really care, know why I care, I feel like this is the optimization that we've written down for optimal control of multi-body systems that most reveals the, the structure and the equations and is most, it's got the strongest clause into leveraging that structure. Cool. This is a generally useful tool Right? If I, 
um, I can do other rational polynomial functions, right? So the simple example that's less complicated than the full multibody. Imagine I just said I had a equations of motion that looked like this. This is my favorite cubic polynomial, but I'm going to screw it up a little bit by putting another x in the denominator. All right, this is just another rational polynomial function. It happens to be a cute one. It looks, you know, similar to what I've done, the curves I had before, but it just it, it, it asymptotes, you know, has linear asymptotes. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same. It has its zeros in the same place. If you want to do sums of squares verification of this, then you can use this implicit form and write a very small program that certifies the region of attraction of this by saying um, that when g of x z equals zero, exactly what I what I wrote there, that implies that partial v partial x times z. greater than zero, which I can do with sauce. Okay? So we need some that extra implicit form to handle rational functions, and they're also a beautiful way to exploit the structure. Is that okay? I, I, I just want you to sense my enthusiasm. That's enough for me. Like, and, and, and to want to read more. Like, like, you know, say, like, what the heck does he, how do you actually take advantage of that? Like, if you have a non-zero chance of ever looking that up, then I've, uh, I'm happy with the last five minutes. But I'm, a, I'm also happy to take questions if anybody wants more. Yes? So if a control line is ultra dynamical system, for example, you have an integrator, does that uh, preserve the structure? Oh. Awesome, okay. So that there's, there's a bunch of really interesting points there. So the question is, what if I put like an integrator into my equations? Um, you don't even need, an, I think the point, so generally speaking, if I have polynomial dynamics and I were to put an integrator in, that would be totally fine. The integrator would add one state to the total state space. I would have, so I'd have one more indeterminate. And I would write my, uh, my Lyapunov conditions over the combined state of the controller with the integrator and the plant. Um, oftentimes, when you write those controllers, if you, if you have a controller gain, so if I were to go through and say, um, let me do it in a fresh board here. So, the, so for instance, even with LQR, the way we've done LQR, um, I have my, my original state variables, which were theta and theta dot, okay? If I do LQR on those original state variables and I get a controller, u equals negative k times theta, theta dot, and then I stick that into my beautiful equations, plus c, you know, equals tau g plus b times k, theta, theta dot. Now I'm in trouble because I have a system of equations that has theta. Now the, the, you know, the coordinates I've got kicking around would be theta and s and c and theta dot. I've, I've like, I'm no longer polynomial only in sine and theta and cosine theta. I think the same thing would happen. Maybe I think that's what you're getting at with the integral too, but you don't even need the integral to, to have that complexity come in. So that is true, that if you write a controller in the original, in the way we often do, then um, you can break this polynomial structure. So I would just say, design your LQR controller and then just use that. And then everything's good again. Why is that okay? Because I mean, sine theta and theta look the same at the linearization anyways. Um, there's no, really no reason to think that k theta is better than k sine theta for that and then you keep your polynomial structure. Great question.
That's a good segue into control. Yeah. So I promised that um, you know these these tools would get us somewhere into into control that using convex optimization we have different guarantees than we could get from a <clears throat> let's say a neural network uh, value iteration. So let's start thinking about that. So. When I say Lyapunov control, I mean I'm going to co-design the controller and the Lyapunov function that proves it's stable. Okay. So let's start. This stuff goes farthest when the dynamics are control affine, which we've been using extensively because it's a fine assumption for multi-body systems. So if my goal is to find the way we stay in the polynomial family here would be to say find a controller u equals um, in general a polynomial function that makes that system satisfy the Lyapunov conditions in the closed loop. I'll find k of x, and I guess I'll find v of x also, OK? All right, so just let's just think about the mechanics of what happens here. So. Uh, if I'm searching for, if I parameterize, let me just say k has some parameters alpha, okay? And v has some other parameters, let me just call them beta here, okay? So these are the two things I'm searching over. I'm searching over polynomials. This is a scalar polynomial. This is a vector of polynomials, okay? But they've all got some coefficient vector alpha and beta that I'm trying to search over. So I want to find some alpha and beta that satisfies those conditions, right? So I'd like v beta x greater than zero. That's standard fare. We've been doing that. That one's fine. The game C is going to be making sure that we can write this down in a way that stays convex when I'm searching for both of them at the same time. Okay, so the tricky one comes down when I say v dot which is partial v, partial x, f of x, now k of x. The rules of the game in sums of squares, if I want to write this, is sums of squares. That poly, I need this to be a polynomial that is linear in the decision vari variables, right? So sums of squares requires that I'm linear in the decision variables. That's a standard fare for convex constraints. Should be linear in the coefficients. But here I've got, uh, you know, if, if V of B is, is a polynomial with coefficients uh, beta and K is a polynomial with coefficients alpha, this thing, if I write it out, is going to have terms that are like alpha 1, beta 2, plus some, you know, something. These, are, these things are going to multiply, and those are not jointly convex in alpha and beta. So this is a bad constraint a non-convex constraint as written. And the game that we need to play to understand how to write effect, you know, 
convex optimizations on these problems is to find ways to parameterize the conditions we care about in a ways that are convex in the decision parameters. Right, this one fails that test as is. But we can often find clever reparameterizations. I mean, this is actually the stuff of, there's some just really deep work in controls over the last you know, 40 years, or, but even recently of, of finding very nice convex reparameterizations of very complicated problems or problems that you wouldn't think would be convex in the parameters. We can do that here. We can take it all the way um, here in a few special cases. But the one that I find most useful for robotics so far, um, I can't actually completely break that non-convexity. So the one I want to tell you about, I'm actually going to just admit that this problem is non-convex in the original parameters. And we're going to solve it by a different, by alternating between multiple convex optimizations. Okay, so this problem is bilinear in the decision variables. It has terms of the form alpha i plus beta j times my indeterminates. So a very, there, you, could, you could take gradient descent and start trying to solve these things jointly, and that could work. You, you know, that may work. But the one that's maybe more unique to this approach, since we know a lot about the, how to write these convex problems, a standard approach would be to, to alternate observe that if alpha is fixed, then the remaining problem is convex in beta. When beta is fixed, the remaining problem is convex in alpha. So it's a very natural, and that's, that's even, if I lift it up again and say, if my controller is fixed, we know that the optimization is convex for looking for Lyapunov functions. And similarly, if my Lyapunov function is fixed, the problem of finding good k's that satisfy that is convex in the parameters of k. It's hard to optimize them both at the same time, but you can optimize them one at a time. Okay, so if we can fix V of beta, optimize K, and then we'll fix K, optimize V, and then repeat until convergence. At some point, these things actually do have nice convergence properties. At some point, um, you know, so, so well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bunch of nice properties of this um, compared to sort of a standard gradient-based optimization, okay? So for instance, um, it is a non-convex optimization. You can have local minima. I want to admit that right up front can have local minima, it doesn't get around that problem. But um, you have a beautiful thing here, which is recursive feasibility. Once I find a Lyapunov controller pair, it will only get better. I, I won't lose it, and they will only get better. It's, it has a monotonic improvement. Right, because <clears throat> if I start with an initial K, uh, sorry, if I start with an initial V and I try to optimize K, my, my initial guess at K was already a feasible solution. So optimizing it, I can only do better. With convex optimization, I can only do better on each of these steps. 
I can take my, my guess at a K, try to find a better Lyapunov function, maybe one that goes downhill faster, for instance. And I can only do better on each of these steps. So it enjoys this very nice sort of fast convergence um, and a monotonic improvement. You don't have to worry about like, okay, I, you know, on iteration 43, I had a stable controller and then 45, I, oh, crap. You know, it's, it's none of that, right? The hard part is you have to find an initial Lyapunov function that is feasible. You have to start it with something that controls my system a little bit, that, okay? But once you have that, you can expect monotonic improvement until it converges and just runs out of steam. So here's where I think it really pays off uh, big dividends, okay? Remember I talked about LQR as a, a locally good controller that for the, for the pendulum, for instance, we could do local linearization and my LQR controller did a really good job with the system around here. And it, this gives me a controller that sort of works locally. So here's a powerful recipe. Take my original system, linearize your nonlinear dynamics, at some fixed point, Solve LQR. LQR gives me two things, right? It gives me u equals negative kx, which I might replace with a sign. And it gives me um, a cost to go, which for the nonlinear system is approximate, that is a nice quadratic form. Now if I can compute the region of attraction using sums of squares of this controller with this Lyapunov guess, then I can compute a beautiful thing, right? It, remember, we first just drew the pictures and said at some point the nonlinear systems fail, and do we, is there any way to know? I think someone asked ex exactly that. Is there any way to know when that linear controller stops being a good approximation for the nonlinear system? Well, yes, there is a way to know, at least to get an inner approximation, right? The real answer might be some strange function with some of the squares I'm finding a inner approximation that's guaranteed to be good like you've been doing in your van der Poel oscillator problem, right? Okay. And it's guaranteed to exist if the linearization was stabilizable. At least locally, there's some quadratic form that certifies the optimality, the performance around there. So I can start my algorithm with the LQR controller and the LQR value function, and I've got an initial guess. Now, if I want to consider more interesting controllers. Maybe I, want to, I don't want to restrict myself to the, well, even if the search for, um, you know, there might be a different K that can work better for the nonlinear system than the original K from LQR. LQR only looked at the dynamics here. It didn't know anything about all the other nonlinear terms. So even searching for a different K with a machinery that takes into account the nonlinear terms can potentially make this region of attraction grow. And it will, I mean, almost, almost certainly, okay? 
But even better, I can search for more and more expressive Ks, okay? search for k of x, v of x, to prove a bigger region of attraction. In fact, when you have to do, to do this particular set of alternations, you actually need to alternate between k, v, and my Lagrange multipliers. Yes? Okay, so the question is, um, which maybe people heard, but I'll, I'll repeat. So the, the, the question is, are you better off trying to find a really big region of attraction to start with, even if it's potentially assumed, I mean, used a local assumption to say something about too big of a state space, and you might get yourself into trouble later? Um, or should you try to, with, you know, start with a small one and then let it grow and let the nonlinear terms do more of the work? I don't have a uh, consistent, I mean, I think we've, we've seen, um, We've seen these, these things work fairly reliably. I don't have a good sense of when the, if starting too big makes the local minima bad. I don't have that sense. Um, I would say typically we try to find the best LQR controller we, we can out of the box and start from there, right? And here's some evidence, right? So um, these are a bunch of pictures. Sorry, to, I, did, I didn't pull them out here, but um, you know, the blue is the LQR basin of attraction. This is for the acrobat. This is for the physical acrobat that we used in lab and we've done a lot of work with, okay? But um, inside this region here is a tiny little basin of attraction that you get in the original coordinates for LQR stabilizing that acrobat, which is pretty tough. If we, we keep V to be quadratic, um, then we, we already do a lot better, but if we make K now be cubic, so it's allowed to search not over only u equals negative kx, but negative kx plus x to the cubed. So it's a more expressive parameterization of the controller. Then we get these reliably much bigger regions of attraction. Okay, this is we've done it for quad rotors, we've done it for our you know, car poles, you know, all kinds of dynamical systems of the scales that we're able to address with this. It very reliably pushes things out. For, please, yes. Can you just reiterate the connection between the results at LQR and what we're feeding in at our initial V? Awesome. So the, the connection that I made quickly was this connection between a cost to go function, which comes out of LQR, and the connection, and using the cost to go function as a candidate Lyapunov function for the, for the region of attraction. I see. Right? So certainly we get a controller from LQR, but the fact that it also gives me a quadratic well, the Apanov candidate in this context means that, so we know that for the linear system, this S is a Lyapunov function for that closed loop system. We know that because of the connection between Hamilton, uh, between cost to go functions of positive costs are always going to be Lyapunov functions. They're always going to satisfy the Lyapunov conditions. Right. So it, within a small region, it'll be a decent guess of the Lyapunov function. For the nonlinear system. Yes, because, because of the, the, if, if we assume the system is smooth, it has some smoothness assumptions required, that at least locally, this is a valid Lyapunov function for a small region of attraction. And then you just push it out. Yes? I'm a little confused at what it means to allow the LQR controller to be able to see the smooth. Just because I, I kind of had it in my mind that the LQR controller would presumably be able to spit out the same region coordinate as this region. Awesome. So, so LQR does always spit out a negative kx. The question was, how does LQR spit out a cubic one? Okay, so um, LQR, you are correct. When I give it a system, I give it a linearization. It takes a linearization in our, you know, and then it produces a linear controller in that linearization. I'm not changing that. What I'm saying is that I can now, when I turn it over to sums of squares, which is the more powerful machinery, 
I can start and say, your initial guess at the controller is k from LQR x plus a bunch of parameters, you know, alpha uh, x squared, let's say, plus beta x cubed. And you're allowed to change these two. And for my initial guess, I'll just set them to zero. But I'll give it the expressive power when, it, when I'm in the alternation, which is searching for k, to also be able to search over those and find a non- This is the region of attraction that's certified. So the, okay, so, so um, the LQR controller is gonna have a, a certain region of attraction, that's the blue. Just, if I were to do no alternations, if I were to just compute the region of attraction, from, that's what I get from blue. Okay, but now if I wanna do control design using sums of squares, I can parameterize my controller more richly and take into account the, the nonlinear dynamics with sums of squares. And I can start alternating saying, can you find a bigger, can you find a bigger, can you find a different k that goes downhill faster? And then given that k, can you find a Lyapunov function that proves a bigger volume of space? So it's just gonna slowly push out the blue into, until it gets to the pink. And the reason the pink stopped there is because I chose, we chose still a quadratic Lyapunov function and a cubic controller. If we made a more expressive Lyapunov function, we could keep going. At some point, the only limit is the, is the, uh, the, the numerics. Great questions, yeah? There's a hint up here. We'll talk, I can't really give you the full story about this until we talk, cover uh, trajectory optimization, okay? But <clears throat> at some point, we're gonna give you a recipe for filling the rest of the space with good regions, okay? And the, the basic trick, which I'll just forecast here, is that if I were to come up with a local trajectory around here, and then I were to stabilize that trajectory and compute these regions of attraction along the trajectories, then I can actually fill up the entire space using the sums of squares machinery with a controller that gets me to the goal from all initial conditions, okay? And that's the reason why we stopped at a quadratic Lyapunov. We didn't, we didn't keep pushing to get larger because that was only the first step of a bigger algorithm, which is trying to actually swing up from, with a, some people, times people call it patchy Lyapunov function. So you're gonna compose a complicated Lyapunov function out of pieces of, of other Lyapunov functions. Awesome. <clears throat> Okay, let me talk about sums of squares dynamic programming as another, oh, please, go ahead. Sorry. Are these things in practice computed in real time? The, the controls, are they being found for given trajectory? Is so, the robots moving around, or are they like pre-computed and then you switch to, say, I, I need to use this controller because I know I need this trajectory now? The, the answer is the second one. So the question is, are, are we computing the sums of squares problems in real time? Um, or, are we, so, or are we switching to them? So we do offline work. It's actually, they're not slow. I mean, and, and if, we, if we needed to solve them online, we, we would be working on accelerating them. Um, but the, traditionally, I thought, I've always thought of this as an offline set, just like you would, if you solved your value iteration, you'd do that offline. The thing that comes out is a super fast and easy to evaluate controller, that, that, that's what you evaluate. And you're right, there's also a, a simple check if you wanna know whether you should even run that controller right now, you can check whether you're inside the region of attraction that you certify, right? If there was, then you could say, yes, I mean, I should, it's worthwhile to evaluate that controller and run it. Yeah, but I think of this as an offline step, yes. Okay, so let's finish this connection between cost to go functions and Lyapunov functions. Sums of squares dynamic programming. <coughs> Do you remember the problem set we did on linear programming for dynamic programming? Do you remember the formulation there, right? The, Call 
LP DP. Sorry for the acronyms, but since you had a notebook called LP DP, maybe I can get away with it. Linear programming for dynamic programming, okay. Where we said in the discrete setting, where we had a discrete S, I always use S for discrete state and A for discrete actions, X and U are for continuous, right? Right, the, in the discrete <coughs> Bellman equation, I said a min, o, min over A, L of S A, This is my optimality conditions. And in the LP formulation, we did this cool trick where we got rid of this min over A, which is sort of a nasty thing, by saying for all A, J of S is less than or equal to Those are the constraints you added to the program, right? You, you said, if, so if it's true for the minimum A, then it must be true for all A. So if, if I were to, in two steps, if I first just change this to less than or equal to, if it's true for the minimum A, then it would also be true for this A. For, for, for all A, sorry. So this gives us a lower bound on the cost to go, and then we tried to maximize sum, I just write it as the sum over S, J of S. Yeah. Took a lower bound and then we pushed up. Well, guess what? Now we can do all the same stuff with polynomials and do a polynomial form of this that does dynamic programming, you know, using all the tools from sums of squares, okay? Continuous world, continuous time, state, dynamic, um, state actions. We have for all x, u equals min over u, lx u. And I have to get rid of that min over u in some way. And a natural way to do it is to say, if it's true for the minimal u, if I turn this into an inequality, then I can say it's true for this inequality must hold for all u. Did that step? land for you in, when you're doing the problem set and does it, am I building on that or is, is, am I assuming that something that didn't happen? This notion of switching to an inequality and then taking the for all A, that's clear? For the objective? No, you're good. So, so, so um, I, I no, you're you're okay. This is great. So I said I'm getting rid of this nasty min, um, and then I wrote a max right below it, which looks annoying. Okay, yeah. So um, this condition, you know, this condition gets rid of the min. Okay, um, and this is gives me a strict lower bound on the the cost to go. Now I'm still free. This, so this is a min over a, which has to be, which is. I don't want to even have that in my program. That's like, a, like my indeterminate, okay? This is a max over the coefficient of j's, which are linear in the coefficients. So this actually max is a convex objective. It's just a linearly pushing up the coefficients of my, the elements of j. That min over a is doing something, um, something gross that I don't even want to put in my decision variables. The only decision variables in that LP were the elements of j. A, we try to get rid of completely. 
I wish I had a more whiz-bang way to say that. But that's, yeah. Same thing, true is, it, same thing is true here. For this, for this to be true for all x, we want to get rid of that u somehow. And we can play the same trick to say it's got to be true for all u and give a lower bound here. And if we move this then to saying that L of x u plus partial j partial x f of x u is sums of squares, that's not exactly the same thing, right? It's a, but there's, there's a potential gap. But this is an interesting way to parameterize um, j, polynomial j's, so that I can have a lower bound, guaranteed lower bound on my cost to go. And then similarly, I can push up. On what, how do I want to push up? I don't have a discrete set of states. I want to somehow maximize the integral over the states of my estimate. Let me call this a hat because to make it clear, this is an estimate. Okay. I'm going to maximize the integral um, of this to try to push up on it over some part of state space. Let me show you it again in code. I think it's very simple in code. Let's see. So I picked the same, basically my same dynamical system that I always like to use for the, um, I always like this negative x plus x cubed. I'm going to, I'm going to change it slightly. I'm going to write instead x dot equals x minus x cubed. That way, the, th this one, the origin was already stable. So that's not as interesting of a control problem. So I'm going to flick it, flip it so the origin is unstable. Not a big deal. Okay. I'm going to add a u so that I have something to do. Okay. And then just so it stays nicely in the, my, my, the code is a little cleaner if I scaled everything between 1 and negative 1. So I'm just going to put a 4 in here to make it so that the interesting stuff happens at 0.5 instead of 1. But I want you to see almost this equation. It's just, a, it's just the same basically an upside down version of the same thing I've already done. So I have my scalar dynamics is, is my x minus 4 x cubed plus u. My cost function is just like the LQR cost, x squared plus u squared. I'm saying input limits are negative 1 and 1, state limits are negative 1 and 1. That's what keeps the scaling nice. Okay. If I plot that, so it's just this same curve, but it, you see I just scaled it so that the unstable, or the, you know, I got an unstable fixed point at the origin, and I got other fixed points happening over here. And now that gives me between negative one and one an interesting thing to try to do some nonlinear control. Okay? X and U are indeterminates. They never show up in the actual solver. And then I make a new polynomial j that's, got, that's just a function of x. Polynomials can be integrated over finite domains. That's a nice thing. And they're still linear in the parameters. So the integral of, of a polynomial is still, linear, is still a linear objective. I still get the, the coefficients of the polynomial as, as linear. So I just add the, I maximize the integral, which is equivalent to linear, um, minimizing the negative of the integral. I, you know, I, have you, you've noticed that I, in mathematical program, you can, I could have just said add cost and it would have figured it out, but I'm adding linear cost. I wrote add linear cost just so that if it, if I put something in that wasn't linear, it would have said, dude, that's not linear. Um, that's just me protecting myself by writing it like that. Because sometimes people will type something in, they'll say add cost or whatever. They think they've got a convex optimization and they're actually calling snopped and they didn't, don't realize what's happening. Okay. 
In order to make the conditions only work over negative one and one, I added S procedure for the input limits and an S procedure, oops, for, for the input limit. Yeah, for the state limits and uh, imp, S procedure for the input limits. And then I just say L of XU plus J dot, include the S procedure, is sums of squares. It's really just that. I added one more line just to set J zero equal to zero, otherwise it could walk around. And this is what happens. Okay, so um, I solved it a bunch of times. I mean, this is a small problem, but that's, I solved it a bunch of times there for different degrees. I, at first I just did a quadratic J and then a fourth order J and then a sixth order J and an eighth order J. I could, could have kept going actually. The only reason not to not keep going is then you wouldn't be able to see the black line, which is the optimal cost to go, which I just computed by brute force, which you, you can do in, in one dimension, but you can't do in general. So I know, I know that black is the, is the true answer. And I know that, and I've asked my sums of squares condition to verify that I have a lower bound, and I'm trying to push up on the lower bound. And the more, and I'm you know, maximizing the integral over under this curve. And the higher the degree, the tighter the approximation. So the, the degree two one is stuck under this slow quadratic here. And so it's very conservative. Doesn't do, me, do much at all for the cost to go. Already with degree four, we get pretty good, but some weird artifacts, degree six, degree eight, and the other ones just start, you can't even see the difference. And the controller pops right out too. Once I have J, I can, um, well certainly, in, this, in the case where it's control affine, the controller pops right out. But once I have J and I have my model, I can in general find my controller. Yeah. Now here's something I find almost extremely satisfying. Okay, it's it's, it's extremely satisfying if I'm at my home computer where I have Mosec. Um, Mosec doesn't support my my new Mac Air, which is ARM 64. So, and the open source solver doesn't quite handle the problem. Okay, so but 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 basically, I can, with that caveat, um, I can swing up a pendulum. I can solve the optimal control for the pendulum just like that with convex optimization. Um, and it gives me these beautiful cost to go functions. If I went to swing this up, it would fall down because I had to set the degree. So the difference here, so it's the same, it's basically the same problem. I did the sine squared, cosine squared trick, but I have to set a degree, a maximum degree. I choose the degree. That's what it looks like for degree four. It's a lower bound. It gets really good when you get up to like degree eight or 10, and then you start swinging up the pendulum. The free solver can only, can't solve the degree 10 one. It says, ah, I got confused. It doesn't say, it doesn't ever give a wrong answer. It just says like, I just couldn't solve that. Um, so that was like really depressing because I you know, like, oh, this is a beautiful example. I've got it working. And, and then I get, and I realized I can't do it on this machine. But if you have Mosec, it works. And actually, I think if I spent another couple of days on it, it would, I would be able to get the open source solver to work too, but I, I wish I didn't have to. Okay, so let's, I mean, just, let's just compare, contrast that. I, I, I think, I mean, that's a super small example. You can, we can try to solve bigger examples. The limitation of this approach, I mean, we can write these things as convex. I think the limitation of this approach is the question of how high the degree needs to be for optimal value functions. Right, optimal value functions can be weird. They don't need to be polynomial. They can have these weird discontinuities and, well, not discontinuities, but cusps, um, non-smoothness, right? The swing up of the pendulum was doing this crazy weird thing, right? It found a good smooth approximation up to some degree. I don't actually know how far that goes. I got, like I said, I, 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 you guys said yes to the, to giving this lecture, so I hacked up some more, some new stuff. I actually think that, the world doesn't know how far that goes. I think it could go really far if we spent a sliver of the time we spent on all the other methods. Um, I, think, I think this is just actually waiting for people to do better with it. <clears throat> okay, so let's, um, let's just make sure you understand here the difference between this 
you know, we've talked about the difference between HJB versus uh, Lyapunov. Well, let me, let me actually stop. Is there any questions about that before I go on? Does it, yes, please. Great question. So the question is, is the sum a particularly good way, reason, a way to maximize j? So <clears throat> this is not particular to sums of squares, although that is a, it's a convenient objective because it is linear in the co coefficients. We did it for the LP1, too, where we, um, I guess we also wanted it to be linear there. But um, so, so even when we talked about dp, and we, the first time we introduced function approximation, I think as soon as you can't satisfy the, the Bellman equation with equality, you suddenly need to have a metric to say, how important are the different states to me? The way I've written it like this, of just the, the integral, it's saying that all states over this domain are equally important to me. That is probably not the right answer. It's like there's probably some stuff in the corner that I'll never visit and I, and I really shouldn't worry that much. And the ones I, around the upright are probably like really important and I should spend a lot of time. So what's the right metric? Um, <laughs> Alex and I were talking about this earlier today, but that I think that uh, probably the right metric would be weighted by the stationary distribution of the optimal policy. The, you, should pet, you should reward the states that you're going to, uh, proportionally to how often you expect to visit them. Something like that. Okay, but I, I don't, if I don't have the optimal policy, I can't weight it like that. So you, could, you can try alternating. That would be another case where you could try alternating. Or you could try some surrogate. Or you could say, you know, I just think stuff around the origin is pretty important and make a quadratic form or something like that. But all of those would be, con you know, constant. They wouldn't change the linearity of that objective. They'd be a constant multiplier times, times my function. So they're all fair game. I just wasn't creative when I did the integral like that. That's a great question, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Good. Um, just curious, like, how does this scale computationally with the degree of the polynomial? So, like, what, you know, what, how far can you push this? Stuff? Yeah. So it's not about. So the question is, how does it scale with the degree of the polynomial? You, it, it, there is a rate at which you add a polynomial. You you get a polynomial growth of your SDP with the polynomial, you know, with the degree. There's there's growth rates like that 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 you should you would have a right to be concerned with. But it's not the, the size of the optimization problem that gets you. It's the numerics of, of taking x to the 14th power and trying to do some math with that. So I think the solution is probably smarter basis parameterizations, especially over like compact domains and stuff. There's better using the, base the monomial basis, which is like you know x1, x2, x squared, x2 cubed. That's a, not a particularly clever choice of basis. I think you probably want to parameterize a smarter family of polynomials to do to get the degrees to be less sensitive. Low hanging fruit, maybe. Good. So um, I, I want to make one super important point here. Um, you know, we've we've been saying this whole time. I've written this like 14 times that the one interpretation is that we've switched from that to this, right? Now, what have I done over here? Um, I've done something that's kind of a mix of the two, uh, right? I did j dot. I actually did, so you'd think I would want to do this, right? That would be like the natural, you know, it would still certify the Lyapunov conditions, but it could uh, it could try to do it with mindfulness about cost. This would be an upper bound on cost to go. And would certify a Lyapunov condition if my cost is if my cost is uh, always positive, then of course the negative of that cost is always going to be less than zero, so that would be a valid Lyapunov function. Sadly, that's not what I did in this example. 
I actually did this one. It's not because I was lazy. Um, it's because that min over u trick only works on one side. That one I'm going to have you verify you for yourself. But this is a convex optimization. This one is not. This one is a lower bound. The reason is for this one, I can say the min over u, I can replace that with for all u. And the inequality is, is stays on the right side, the correct side. Okay. This one, I cannot play the trick. I cannot say less than min over u is, is just is for all u. That trick breaks. So I want you to know, even though this is awesome, um, it, is, it does not actually give you something that certifies the Lyapunov conditions. It gives you an, a lower bound on the cost to go. OK, well, thank you for humoring me with, the, with our talk of Lyapunov and everything. There's a bunch of other extensions, like a, a bazillion other extensions that we could talk about. I put at least call outs to them in the notes. People are all the rage of trying to, to use neural networks for Lyapunov functions these days. But they're hard, th so it's easy to parameterize a positive v. It's hard to get v dot promised to be negative. But there's some citations for some of the stuff that's happening there. It's a good topic. And I will see you on Thursday for trajectory optimization.